Disclosure, I was invited by the tank museum at Bobbington in 2019. You can see the Challenger tank, although it seems like a huge steel beast, its armor also contains ceramics in it. Now ceramics are known to be rather hard, but also quite brittle, since often with high hardness comes less ductility. High hardness can result in the armor breaking and generally reduces also multi-hit capability. This of course raises the question, why use ceramic ammo in the first place? Well, as so often, there are several factors involved. The first and fundamental aspect here is the disruptor and absorber concept. To put it simply, one wants to disrupt or blunt the incoming projectile and also absorb large amounts of energy as well. So ideally one combines a material with high strength that acts as a disruptor. The purpose of these high strength materials is to blunt the incoming projectile or rapidly erode it. If the projectile is fragmented, a hard material will tend to radially disperse the fragments. Therefore the kinetic energy of the projectile is deflected and dispersed in the fragments. Additionally to the disruptor we want a material that serves as an absorber, so a material which can sustain large amounts of plastic deformation before it fails. Examples of absorbers would be rolled homogeneous armor, polymers or fiber reinforced plastics. In case of World War II this concept was realized to a degree with armor plates that had face hardened armor, like the Panzer III. Whereas homogeneous armor has the same hardness all the way through, generally about 220 to 300 Brillinel hardness number, while face hardened armor has a thin layer of 450 to 650 Brillinel hardness in an otherwise homogeneous plate. To give you some idea about the effectiveness, a 2 pounder armor piercing shell could penetrate 86 mm of homogeneous armor at 0 degree and point blank range yet only 66 mm if the armor was face hardened. Yet there is more we need to discuss, because the ceramics we know from day to day life, like those in our bathrooms, are a bit different to technical ceramics used in armor. Professor Paul Hazel from the University of New South Wales Canberra will give us a short overview about them. The ceramics, when we, the ones that we deploy on armor systems, uh, generally are, well, they are always what we call technical ceramics or engineering ceramics, which are fully densified structures. Normally, they would comprise of um, self-selecting atoms, which one of which would be um, uh, metallic and one would be non-metallic. So, uh, for example, um, uh, aluminium oxide. So you've got aluminium there and you've got an oxide um, uh, part of the, the the molecule. So the what um, ceramics uh, do is that they they offer a, a really good way of uh, providing a resistance to penetration by simply because they they are hard, fully densified structures. And what I mean by that is not to say that they're they're dense. Uh, per se, that they, they tend to have low density values compared to other materials. Um, but they, in, in the armor context, they, they tend to have um, fairly, um, they're, they're strong, they're, they're resilient, they have high hardness values, and they've been engineered that way. So, you know, that's why we would choose to use um, one of those, those materials. It's just a material class that's kind of um, provides a, a, a good degree of hardness. Um, and low density. The next question to ask is how ceramic armor could be combined with other armor materials. As a heads up for the uninitiated, a heat round is a high explosive anti-tank round, also called horror or shape charge, like a Panzerfaust. Here's a short visualization about it. The effect is called Munro or Neumann effect. So how does this effect work? Here you can see the warhead. Such a warhead is generally called a hollow charge or a shaped charge. As you can see, both make sense because the charge is both hollow and shaped. So when the warhead impacts, the impact fuse sets off the booster charge. This then leads to the detonation of the explosive charge, which focuses the explosion and deforms the warhead's conical metal liner into a high velocity jet. This jet is so fast that it penetrates the armor. Be aware it does not burn through, a common misconception and an error that I made myself in the past. 
Professor Hazel will give you now some examples on how ceramic armor could be combined with other armor. It would depend upon um, a number of factors. It would, it, it would depend upon the type of projectile that you're, you're trying to defeat. So, for example, um, a multi-layered, where you've got multiple layers of ceramic, might be appropriate for defeating a heat round uh, for various reasons. Uh, whereas a um, for, for body armors, you know, and of, uh, uh, where you would need a ceramic tile... Um, with a, a, a backing, you might choose to use your, uh, a ceramic and a composite backing, which would provide, which, you know, provide that disruptor absorber concept um, that I previously mentioned. Um, so the ceramics providing the hard um, outer surface, a bit like our you know, face um, hardened example that we discussed with the Tiger Tank, um, and, and the backing layer provides, you know, the composite layer provides a kind of an energy absorbing layer that can absorb the sort of the resulting fragments that have, that, that have formed. So, and that's kind of how we, we get over that, um, that, that sort of negative aspect, I suppose, of, of the brittle nature of, of ceramics. So the composite would be something like Kefla? Yes, exactly right. Um, you know, for, for, for higher, um, you know, for not just for personal protection, but uh, if you look at vehicle armor and that type of thing, you might be using a glass fiber reinforced plastic or an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene is another example where, um, you know, those types of, of materials are, are used. You know, there's, there's a whole range of, of, of composites that are used. The, the one composite that shouldn't be used is actually carbon fiber. And the reason for that is, Carbon tends to have a f carbon fibers that are just too brittle, and carbon panels tend to have a low translaminar strength. So, in other words, they're not very good at um, dealing with punch forces. Now, you probably ask, how does a multi layered steel ceramic armor defeat shaped charmed jets? Well, glad you asked, since this is described and shown in Professor Hazel's book. We have a composite armor consisting of three layers of steel, and in between are two layers of glass. The shape charge penetrates the outer steel layer. Once a jet reaches the interface between the first steel and glass layer, shocks emerge. This does not stop the jet though. Yet the shock reflects off the steel layer. This reflected compression wave results in a reverb movement of the first steel layer that drives some parts into the path of the jet. Additionally, at the same time, fractured parts of the glass layer is also pushed into the jet. These movements result in a narrowing of the penetration cavity and is repeated with the subsequent layer as well. Additionally, the glass interlayer provides additional resistance to penetration due to spring back. When a jet penetrates a glass target, the penetration path opens up to its maximum diameter within a few microseconds and then closes rapidly after the penetration front passes. It is thought that the closure of the penetration cavity is caused by rapid elastic recovery from high pressure near the penetration front. Furthermore, shape charges used against strong ceramic produce narrow cavities compared to metals. One aspect that makes ceramic suited for layered armor is that the cone of damage is produced from the point of penetration outward, as you can see here. This means that the energy of the projectile load is spread out over a wider area which should reduce the load on the absorber layer behind the ceramic armor. In the context of a two-component ceramic armor system, it would be expected that the force of the penetrating projectile would be spread over a larger surface area, implying a better resistance to penetration. Some properties of ceramic armor make it ideal for defeating shape charges, like fragmentation. Yet these properties are generally less suited for dealing with kinetic rounds. As such, for me, the question was if ceramic armor can be used against kinetic rounds. With tank armors, what you're trying to do is to um, maximize a process called interface defeat or, um, or dwell. So what you would do there is that you would design your, um, your, your tank armor so that you can cleverly maintain a compressive force on the projectile as it's penetrating through it. Um, and uh, the, the way that, that that's achieved is th through a sort of a clever uh, methodology of confinement. Um, 
so yeah, I'm I'm being deliberately vague there. That's that's all I could probably say in that in that, in that respect. Well, I guess we reached the classified era. So let's take a short look at some history. The first mind-scale operational use of ceramic armor was during the Vietnam War, namely for a body armor of US helicopter crews. In 1965, such vests were started to produce. Additionally, the UE-1 Huey were also equipped with ceramic armor elements. In 1965, the UE-1 Huey was fitted with half-faced composite armor kit used in the armored seats of the pilot and co-pilot. The seats provided protection against 7.62mm armor-piercing ammunition on the seat bottom sides and back using boron carbide phase fiberglass. Similar systems were also installed in the HA-1 Cobra as well. Before we summarize this video, let us take a short look at the main advantages and disadvantages of ceramic armor versus metal armor. The advantages are as follows. Good level of ballistic resistance relative to the required thickness. Lightweight solution against certain threats, for instance shaped charges. Hard material. Relatively cheap in terms of logistical requirements due to its lightweight and small size. The disadvantages are weak multi-hit capability. Due to its brittleness, it can't be used for load-bearing structures, hence it is parasitic in nature. It can easily fracture, which can result in damage in regular use or even during transport. For high-performing ceramics, the cost can be relatively expensive. Additionally, the production process of high-performing ceramics is very complex, which reduces availability. To summarize, why ceramic armor is used? First, it provides very good resistance against certain threats like shape charges against which regular steel armor provides very limited resistance. Main drawback of ceramic armor is that it is far less versatile than steel armor. For instance, you can't build a tank out of ceramic armor alone. Due to its brittleness, it must be combined. Second, due to its high hardness, it also works well as a disruptor against kinetic rounds when combined with proper absorber material. Big thank you here to Professor Paul Hazel for the interview. Thank you to the Tank Museum at Bobbington for inviting me. Thank you for watching and see you next time.